Welcome viewers to our ongoing program focus coming to you from Channel 17 Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. We are also Town Meeting TV, Open Access TV. And today I want to welcome a very special guest, Lauren Glenn Davidian, the Chief Executive Officer of CCTV, which is our station. Welcome, Lauren. And you're in an opposite position. Usually you're the one doing the interviewing, right? It's always a pleasure to see you, Margaret. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, thank you so much for being here. Lauren, it's uh, kind of confusing times for community producers like myself. I've been, I've been a community producer for Channel 17 for going into 15 years now with my uh, first show, Nuclear Free Future Conversation. And then the second one I started six years ago, which is called Focus, which is this program we're doing. And I, I sent you questions for our conversation and uh, I, I don't think that we can cover all of them and maybe it's not appropriate to cover all of them today, but uh, I'd like to start off with uh, what is the 10 year plan that uh, looking ahead and why is it important for community producers like myself and so many community producers who are uh, doing shows or have done shows before COVID on Town Meeting TV. And why is it important for us to weigh in on it? And because although I've given input over the years uh, when asked to on the questions for CCTV, I haven't sent any comment this time and I'd like to know why it's important and also that it's a 10 year plan, that's interesting. So I'm not sure um, where the 10 year plan came from, except the state is doing a 10 year plan, um, which is a little different than the planning horizon for CCTV and town meeting television. So, um, so maybe we'll just sort that out because that might be what you're asking about. Uh, the first is that the state of Vermont creates a 10 year telecommunications plan, which they update every three years. And in this past um, cycle, the state wasn't too satisfied with the Department of Public Services uh, work product. So they decided to hire a third party to actually run this 10 year plan. Um, I think it's very difficult for the state of Vermont to do a 10 year telecommunications plan. Just imagine, I mean, it covers cable, it covers telephone, it co covers cellular, it co covers broadband. I mean, you have to be an expert in pretty much everything in order to generate a coherent vision for the future. But the state's focus is on getting broadband to as many households as possible. And that's less important in Chittenden County because we're very dense and the companies like Comcast and the phone companies have gotten broadband to as many people as possibly can get it. I think it's probably true, maybe with some exceptions. But in other rural parts of the state, uh, getting broadband out is an issue. So that's really been the state's priority and all the other priorities are secondary to that in their one, two, three, five, 10 year planning process. And plus there's a lot of federal money in the pipeline to help make that happen. And I could, you know, I think that might actually not be what you want to focus on. That's, we could talk about that in another show because there's certainly, um, I have opinions about that. But as far as community media is concerned and public educational and government access, we have, um, and this applies to both the state's planning and our own planning, is we all know that people are cutting the cable cord. And when people cut their cable subscriptions, that means less money for community media, for town meeting television, channel 17, and the other 25 centers around the state. And that cord cutting is happening faster and faster because on the internet, people can get any service that they want. They just buy a la carte the kind of programs that they want. And the federal government has basically prohibited the state from putting a, a kind of franchise fee or a fee on internet like we do on cable. So the question is, what is the alternative funding going to be to continue to support this really only the only non-commercial community production in the country. I mean, make no mistake, Facebook and YouTube, those are not 
um, open media platforms. Those are data gathering companies. That's really what they're about is gathering data. Um, I wouldn't even call them media companies at all. And so community media and the work we do is the only non-commercial outlet truly that there are for people to express their views, produce their own programs and talk back and forth to each other. So I'll pause there and then I can say a little bit about what we're doing um, to address this revenue loss. But let me just pause there in case you had another okay. question. Okay, well, yes, I, I have a, a question about the financing of, of CCTV, Town Meeting TV, <laughs> Center for Media and Democracy. Are you saying that when I watch our, our shows on only on the internet, I am not financially supporting the this your state the station because I'm not a cable customer. Is that it? Yeah. So if you have a cable subscription, anybody who has cable on their bill is about a five and a half percent fee for public educational and government access channels, and that's true across the state, and that's true on Comcast and Burlington Telecom and Waitsfield Cable. You know, when we started this work in the 80s, there were 50 cable companies, and now I think there are seven. So anyone who is a subscriber of those seven cable companies pay a fee that contribute to these community media channels. And um, they fund Town Meeting TV, Channel 17, which is now 1087 um, on Comcast and 17 and 317 on BT. And that money comes from cable subscribers. So we distribute on the internet. If you're watching on the internet, you're not funding us um, specifically, right? So we, um, you know, CCTV, which is the mothership and which was started in 1984, has run a variety of different community media programs over the 35 plus years that we've been in business. And Town Meeting TV, we started in 1990. So it's one of the projects that we run. And Town Meeting TV is funded primarily by cable subscriber dollars. But as those cable subscriber dollars go down, CCTV has uh, addressed this revenue issue, which we've known about since 1990, um, through a variety of ways. One of them is we create other projects that we can share expenses with, like the Community Technology Center or Common Good Vermont. So over our history, we've created other kinds of community media-based projects. And we also raise money like typical nonprofits. So we have um, fundraising, which you and others contribute to that's just straight up philanthropy. We do grant writing, we do um, underwriting. So we ask businesses to help support the programming that we do. And then we also have a production company and the money that we make from that production company goes back to help support um, the, the non, you know, the, the, the community-based content that doesn't actually generate its own dollars. So we've okay. tried to diversify our revenue in a variety of ways um, in order to offset this decline in cable revenue. And we also are working in the legislature to come up with a law that would create a different funding source, another funding source, in addition to the cable franchise fee. Well, how is that uh, law progressing or what, what would be the, the law? Yeah, so, um, so there are 25 community media centers and um, we were recognized as essential service by the legislature during the pandemic. So that was very exciting. And we also received some COVID relief dollars from the legislature in order to uh, recognize and fund all these virtual public meetings that we were doing and the, the support to education and the support to graduations and the community being able to speak and connect with each other during this period. So the legislature is, I would say, pretty strong fan of our work, which is really good. And as part of that, they funded a, a study, which we call the PEG study, Public Educational Government Access, PEG study. And that study, uh, hired a lawyer to do a legal analysis of financial options that are alternatives to this cable franchise fee that we all rely on. And there are five different ideas in there. And um, the idea that I think has probably the most legs is a poll attachment fee, which means that 
any telecommunications or communications company that attaches to the poles that you see in the streets, which live in public property, it's called the public right of way, that's public property. And that's the basis of the cable franchise fee that cable companies use public property to string their cables and then they compensate the state for the use of that public property. So I think that that principle applies and could be applied to other carriers and then to create a fund that would fund not only community media, public access, PEG access, but also universal service and E91 and other public benefits that come from the use of these cables and this public right of way. So that's, I think, one of the strongest ideas in the PEG study. And we're just about to sit down with a legislative working group to craft some legislation to be considered next session. That sounds very exciting and positive. And the expansion of broadband throughout Vermont would also augment that revenue, wouldn't it? Well, it could if it was a fee that was applied to all carriers, not just broadband carriers. Um, as I said, the federal government has really tied the hands of the state on uh, being able to tax internet services or broadband services. So you have to find a fee that applies, not doesn't single anyone out, any one type of company out. And we think that this idea of a pole attachment fee has some legs. Now there's opposition um, to this idea. Even the Vermont Department of Public Service doesn't like it. Um, ideally they're a consumer advocate and they should be friendly to us, but they're not friendly to this idea. So we're gonna try and find out some more about really what their objections are. And so there's a road to hoe. You know, this isn't, this is, a, as I said, we've been concerned with this since 1990. So what is it? It's 2021. So it's been, you know, three decades that we've been worried about this decline of cable revenue and tried to do something about it. So I'm not expecting we're going to have an immediate solution, but we are seeing the revenue decline. Um, the, the projections, the trades, the trade magazines say that about 5% decline in cable revenue a year is expected. So that means in the next seven years, that could be a 35% decline. And we can't raise enough philanthropic dollars or sell enough production services to offset that decline. It's too fast. So we clearly need a legislative solution to help offset. It's never going to fully replace the franchise fee, none of these sources, but together, we, I think we could preserve community media for the future. Well, that also sounds like a, a tough road to hoe. I mean, it, 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 with everything going on right now, and you mentioned Common Good, which was a wonderful program, which you hosted for how many years, Lauren? Yeah, we started that in 2008, just when the markets crashed. <laughs> um, Vermont had had a Vermont Association of Nonprofit Organizations for many years, and their model just of, of providing in-person training they just weren't able to keep it going financially. So the Community Foundation put out a, a call and a request for proposals for a solution to help nonprofits be connected with each other and share knowledge and information. And CCTV thought, well, we're really good party planners. You know, we can bring people together. We're conveners. This is, you know, one of our core competencies. And we're also very good um, media producers. So we made a proposal for a kind of novel nonprofit association that wasn't a membership-based association, but really was a shared uh, hub or an exchange of, of knowledge and information and produced content and network building. And so the Community Foundation gave us an initial grant. And then for the next 10 years or so, we uh, raised money and ran that as a as a project, part of CCTV. It helped offset the other costs so we could share costs with town meeting television. So, you know, having another project brings your rent down or your other overhead costs down. So that was good. And then um, we spun it off first to Marlboro College, which closed. And then with Morgan Webster, who was running it, she's now running that under the United Way of Northwestern, Northwestern Vermont. So Common Good has legs, it's continuing. 
under incredibly able leadership and still provides important services for the city. And, um, you know, we've seen ourselves as an incubator. So not all the projects we do, we have to keep doing forever. You know, they, they ideally could have a life of their own and Common Good Vermont, I think is a good success story. Right, and now, um, Lauren, where can you access Common Good Vermont? You can go online and look up Common Good Vermont and there's a web and there's for summer camp. I think might be virtual. Usually people get together in person. There's workshops that they host or have third party. They share information. And really, if you want to know who's that's in the nonprofit sector, it's a great place to go. Um, you know, in fact, yesterday I was on a call because I found out about it from Common Good Vermont with the independent sector, which is a national uh, advocacy group for nonprofits. Independent sector is another way of describing nonprofits. And they were talking about the almost $4 trillion in infrastructure that Congress is considering. I mean, that's just an epic amount of money. I can't even absorb it, but $4 trillion that will have a big impact on the nonprofit sector because whether it's housing or weatherization or uh, childcare, any of these aspects, they're considering infrastructure broadly speaking, and that a lot of that money will flow through our colleagues who work in this independent sector um, and we will be using these dollars to, to make our communities more resilient and meet the needs, the very pressing needs. And as you know, we've seen so many cracks in how our systems work, especially during the pandemic. So that's partly what those dollars are meant to address. So I, I'm a little concerned about this scale, four trillion, um, but it, that's a good example of uh, Common Good Vermont, getting information out, me signing on to a workshop, me learning more about what's happening in the advocacy efforts for the sector, which affect the work that we do and our colleagues. Okay. Now, is the time over for comments for, from community producers to this? For the 10-year plan, yeah. The 10-year plan has been adopted. Um, I would say the public process was less than stellar. But we did our best to let people know what was going on. And so, yes, the, the comments are closed. Um, we made, we being Vermont Access Network, which is this network of the 25 community media centers, we were very much on the front line of those, uh, uh, of those comments and involved in the 10-year plan. I, um, again, I think because the Department of Public Service doesn't love our revenue ideas, we didn't get as much um, positive language in that 10 year plan as I would have liked, but we certainly tried on behalf of all of our producers. And that can be found, it's the Vermont 10 year telecommunications plan. And it's, I think the Department of Public Service site, but if you just Google Vermont 10 year telecommunications plan, you can read it. It's okay. epic. Yeah. Great. There all is right. a section on public access. Is that, there is, is that, an action on public access in that. Oh, okay, plan. great. Now let's let's talk about the underwriters, which is new to uh, the station. And uh, I was quite surprised by it when it uh, was introduced. It seems only a few months ago. Well, our, our year, our funding year starts in October and um, the revenue projections for town meeting TV are, as I said, have been affected by these cable cord cutting. And I will say that cable cord cutting is more rampant in Chittenden County than it is in other parts of the state. There are actually parts of Vermont where revenue is going up because the way that Comcast sells its broadband internet service is packaging it with cable. So if you want to get the internet, they really package it so you get cable too. So the numbers are going up in other places, but in Burlington, there's competition with BT. And um, so in any event, our cable revenue has gone down for town meeting television. And the town meeting television has trustees, which are representatives from each of the municipalities and they set a budget. We help them, CCTV help them set a budget, but they set a budget. And this year they really couldn't afford what it cost for us to deliver the level of service to have for CCTV to deliver 
level service. So CCTB agreed to fundraise um, to make up the difference because the trustees who are these municipal representatives hire CCTV to run this town meeting television for them. They don't, there's no staff there. It's a contract with us. And so we have the development capacity and we said, all right, you know, we'll, we'll make up the difference, which was about 80, $90,000 between what it was costing us, you know, to have the level staff that we have and deliver the services that everyone enjoys and what, the cable revenue available is. So we had to get creative quickly because we've only, CCTV maybe raised $40,000 in a year. And all of a sudden now our goal was more in the order of 100,000 or 110,000. So we thought we would explore underwriting, which is something we did with Common Good Vermont. And we had some success there and we set a goal of about $10,000. And that's basically to ask businesses to, you know, underwrite our work, appear on our newsletters, appear on our channel, appear on programs, appear on the website, and um, actually not on programs, but on our bulletin board for $500 for a half a year or $1,000 for a full year. So we were able to raise about $5,000 that way from friends, you know, people that we knew. It's, it's hard to cold call. It's hard to call companies out of the blue and say, would you support this? It takes a lot of effort um, so I don't think we're going to meet our $10,000 goal in underwriting, but I think we could probably annually raise somewhere in the order of five to seven and perhaps, you know, build that over time. But this year was an experiment on the underwriting. And as I said, the people who funded us, you know, um, uh, law firms that are advocates, MMR, Momo's Market, which is uh, Aaron Malone runs, which is on the old Willard Street Market, Action Circles, which is an advocacy group. And um, there are a few others. And um, Hanson Dreamus, they're a financial services and Ben and Jerry's, you know, so we've had some people that are in our circle supporting us in that way. But the good news is we've raised about $70,000 in philanthropy in, in small donations. And that's you know, doubling what we've done in the past. And that's because we've been asking more frequently. I think that's probably um, the reason. And we've also benefited from a few major gifts, which have been incredibly generous. Mm -hmm. Lauren, when you say the board of the trustees, is that the board of trustees for, for, C, for CCTV? No, CCTV is a nonprofit, CCTV Center for Media and Democracy. And we have a contract with the Government Access Channel Trust. And those are trustees and those are representatives from each municipality. And so they're the caretakers of the Government Access Channel in our region. And when we started that in 1990, because CCTV did the advocacy work with the support of the municipalities, the municipal leadership said, well, we don't wanna hire staff and, you know, we." This, we wanna make this as simple as possible. So we will contract for the services to run this channel on our behalf, purchase equipment, hire the people, produce content, cover meetings, serve community producers. You will deliver these services to us. So we, CCTV and its board and its staff has a contract with the town meeting television trustees to run town meeting TV known as channel 17, but 1087, 17, and 317 for them. So that's how that works. So we have this arm's length relationship with the trustees and we run the channel on their behalf. Okay, and how, wh what is the role of the board, the, the uh, you see, town you meeting TV board? Oh, the town meeting TV trustees, essentially yes. they, um, they are the caretakers of the funds that Comcast and Burlington Telecom pay to them. Um, and also municipalities are now making contributions for coverage and internet service and hybrid meeting coverage. So they're the caretakers of those funds and they're responsible to um, essentially sign a contract with us, CCTV or any vendor that they choose, but they've chosen us to do it to operate the channel on their behalf. So they have their own audit and they have their own financial management and they, um, they meet and they talk about policy 
programming policy and they talk about financial management. Like, oh, we have this money, should we invest it, for example? And when it comes to policy, for example, you know, when we have election, election years, we have, we dust off the election policies and have everybody look at them just to make sure that they're up to date and they're in keeping with the times. Or if there's a dispute about some election coverage that elevates to the trustees, they'll look at it and they'll give us an opinion on how to change the policies. So they, that's really what their job is, is policy and finance. Right, but that, and that's separate from the board for CCTV board, right? Right, because you have a separate, and so that's, that's my question. What is the function of the CCTV board? Yeah, so CCTV is the nonprofit that was started in 1984, and our job is to build community through media. That's, you know, sort of the simple version. And that board is responsible for hiring the executive director. They're responsible for financial management of the organization. They're responsible for strategy and future thinking. And um, basically, they hire the ED, which is me, and then I'm responsible for hiring everyone else to run the programs. And so Town Meeting TV represents about 70% of our revenue and our labor. Um, so that's a big project of CCTV's big contract that we run. So we need to fill, fulfill the contract obligations. And then we have this production company, which generates about nine or 10% of our revenue and our labor. And then we have our fundraising arm, which is about 12% of our labor. So that's my job is to oversee that on behalf of the board. But the board, as I said, is finance strategy policy. Okay, and how often does the board meet? They meet about monthly. Yeah, right now um, we've been doing some strategy work so to focus on what our strategy, our strategy is going forward in order to sharpen the services that we offer and rethink how we spend our dollars and how we face this declining cable revenue. That's a big, you know, that's a big question on the table. Um, how much of that burden of uh, making up the difference of the town meeting contract should we continue to do? Are there new programs that we should be considering? Is there a different way, a better, more innovative way of delivering our services? These are the kinds of questions that we, um, the board considers. And we're and looking at- How do you get on the board? Yeah, you, we have some openings on the board right now. We made it small. We small, what's the word? That we, um, I want to say we smalled the board. <laughs> That's okay. We made the board smaller. Better um, than smelt. Yeah, we smelt it. Yeah, the board right now is five. We could have as many as 13. And we were in, in the past five years, we were in discussions with what is now the media factory about potentially merging with them. And we didn't actually at that time um, over, we actually have been talking for about 10 years with them about that. They managed to merge. Um, we were not included in that and that's fine, but we thought we would keep the board small in the event that we did a merger and we haven't. And so now we're in the process of building the board back up. And so there is interest if there, I mean, you might, I, I would like people that are our users, people who are involved in the work that we do um, to consider board involvement. And so we're starting a recruiting this summer for new board members. And yeah. how will you go about that? You can, well, on this show, you can, you're yeah. talking about it. So, but how, what is your plan to get new board members? Well, I think um, there's, the board is, has basically discussed sort of two sets of criteria. One is representation from the community so that we are better representing the community that we serve. And both in terms of age, because you know, the, the people who financially support CCTV's work skew to older. And that makes sense because we've been doing this for 35 years and those people have gotten older with us. So broadening the base to the younger people and broadening the pay, base to people with different ethnic backgrounds and also um, political and just generally maybe different thinkers and people. So there's that representation, diversity, and then there is skill sets. You know, it would be help, helpful to have 
people that are active producers who would be helpful to have people with some legal experience some people with some development shops and and contacts in the community because you know very often our our board has not historically been a board where everyone's got to raise a certain amount of money but we do need to have board members that have an appetite to help us to be champions and ambassadors and also to feel good enough about what we do to ask other people for support. So I think that sort of sums up the conversations that we've had on the board level. You know, enthusiasts, people who love free speech, they love this work and they feel that they love it enough, they're willing to spend some time helping this organization achieve those goals. Okay. Well, Lauren, we've, we've gone through about half an hour now and you've given us so much information and I'm speaking on behalf of the community producers today. I hope that this program can be sent to all of the community producers. When I received a, uh, the appeal from Megan O'Rourke, the channel director, to comment on the 10, what I, I can, I still call the 10 year plan. It, she, it was listed the whole list of community producers. And I said, wow, you know, it looked like about maybe 70 community producers and I haven't caught up and seen all, the, all those shows at all. And uh, on behalf of community producers, I appreciate the, uh, the ability to get on the air with so many different, we, we have a broad range of views and politics and issues and uh, concerns. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to have an, an equality to, uh, to get on the air. So, uh, so I appreciate that so much. So I'm, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think that you're really asking me about the survey that Megan O'Rourke, our channel director at Town Meeting TV, sent out to community producers to find out what you would like, given that the pandemic is over and we're about to open our doors again physically in September. And I think it's that survey that you're actually asking me about. So, and I'm sorry because I'm such an advocacy wonk that I only think about these things, like the 10 year plan. So when I hear that, I think I misunderstood what you were asking me about. So that plan, um, that survey is, and I wanna just encourage people, that is a valuable assessment of what our active community producers on Town Meeting TV are interested in going forward. So I would, that's not too late to complete that. Megan is very interested to hear from community producers. And I think that you had a couple of questions on your list. Um, I know we might be over time, but the great thing about community media is you can go over time. Um, <laughs> and so did you wanna ask those questions or is that something you wanted to save and ask for, ask Megan? I mean, I think you had some questions about priorities in terms of- Right, well, well one of the questions I would like to ask today is that uh, there is the featured shows format, which every week the station sends out the featured shows and there are maybe four of them, maybe, maybe fewer. And uh, then you can hit on the uh, button that says view full schedule. But uh, in my opinion, that minimizes the shows that have been done during the week or during the time frame, And I would like to know, or I would like a change in that. I think that it is, is not good journalism. And after all, we are doing media journalism, video journalism, and uh, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, the standards of, of video journalism that I want to, that I aspire to as a community producer. And, and I want a, uh, something that will give an equal voice to anybody who is doing a, uh, a show on, on the station. Because by showing preference to those or highlighting shows in the week, this, and this is my opinion, it minimizes the other shows. And, and recently because of the pandemic, I suppose 
I didn't even know that some of my shows had been shown maybe once, you know, and uh, I, you know, I, I was unaware of it. So. Well, that's interesting feedback and I appreciate that. I think um, just to give you a little background on that newsletter, that newsletter is part of an overall marketing strategy that we have so that we promote programs, not just on our weekly newsletter, but on social media once they're, when they're produced. And one of the sort of challenges of producing a hundred hours of programming every month, which is collectively what we all produce, is to help people focus on um, things that are timely issues that, for example, at a city council meeting might have gotten a lot of public attention or um, programs that are dealing with something that's happening that week, like Juneteenth or something along those lines. So there's always been a lot, this kind of push pull between public access, first come first served, which we do. I mean, we serve everyone that comes in and then um, curating the content so people who are viewers have help focusing on what's in this hundred hours of incredible content. And so the idea behind the marketing is to elevate programs, not because they're favorites, but because either they're timely, it's something happening that week, or um, it's an issue that a lot of people are concerned about and we actually have video on it that will add information to them for them to understand an issue more like the trash hauling, for example, issue or reapportionment, you know, things that maybe aren't that exciting but are important to a lot of people. So um, I think that the idea is to rotate that so that there is representation of all the pro community producers as well. But that's the line that we're walking there and that what you see in the newsletter isn't the only way that we are putting spotlights on programs that are produced but putting spotlights on programs that are produced i think is a way to help viewers uh, sort through what is a lot of content and to and to and we hear that a lot i mean that's sort of from the viewer perspective for years that is like the number one thing help me understand what's important to focus on. And I wouldn't say that we help people understand what's important to focus on, but we're trying to just shed light on the things that are pressing at any given time, um, as well as represent the variety of content that we have. Mm -hmm. So if you have specific ideas about how to change that in the newsletter, um, that would be great to put on that survey. We'd, I'd love to hear that. And Megan would too. Well, I I do have some ideas, and uh, one would be to to give an, an equal uh, an equal equality in viewing of of the programs that are uh, are offered, because uh, and who who by the way chooses the the spotlight. I mean, yeah, that's collective. I mean, when we have a staff meeting, we'll say, you know, what happened at the meetings? Is there something we need to focus on that would be helpful for people to understand what happened in Essex on separation, what happened in South Burlington on that traffic exchange, you know, things like that. So the staff will, re will recommend things to our marketing director and then she'll put that all together. And, you know, if, if we're doing a hundred programs a month, we're doing 25 a week. And so really the idea is to drive people to see what's happening and then connect them to all the other content that we have. Mm. So it, it's not meant to be exclusive. It's actually meant to like draw people in so they're interested enough to see all the things that we're doing. Well, I feel excluded. I felt excluded mm. many times mm. and especially during COVID time. And I feel that on behalf of all of the community producers that uh, I look forward to more equality in programming. And what, and as far as it's being open access TV, it's, uh, as I understand it, it's open to all viewpoints. And even if the dominant viewpoint in, for the marketing board is, 
is not what a particular show has, then I don't see why that show should be minimized. So I do have a complaint and I'm, I'm, st I, I'm offering that complaint in our program and uh, I'm, I look forward to some kind of a, uh, uh, a, uh, an address to it, uh, some kind of a, a remedy to it. So are and, you uh, concerned about production or promotion? I'm, I'm concerned about viewing, access to viewing, that when you highlight a handful of shows for the week, mm -hmm. that's often, I mean, if, if that is what people asked you to do, I mean, that's what you're doing. It's, it's to highlighting programs at the expense of other programs. And I, I can speak personally that yeah. my programs have been minimized at the expense of, of other programs. And maybe there isn't like when you have, and by the way, in my long, long life, I, I've worked in, in journalism, in both Gannett newspapers and all different kinds of newspapers in different states. And uh, I realized, you know, the importance of the front page and the, uh, the right-hand column, the left-hand column, the contents in the center and all of that. But uh, there, there has to be some way to give a, an equality to the, uh, the programming. And I know, and that's all I'm gonna say for now, Lauren. And yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have any particular way of, um, of solving the problem myself, but I, for me, it, it is a problem. Yeah, I think I, I appreciate that. And I would also just clarify that on the air, um, programs are all aired the same number of times. So there is an equality in terms of what appears on the air and on the internet. They're certainly available all the time. So I think if I was to narrow down what your concern is, it has to do with the marketing and the promotion. And it might be helpful to get a little more insight from the staff that do the work to understand their thinking and then also to discuss it with the channel director, with Megan, um, because I think that would be the quickest way to get some response. Mm. Yeah, so I appreciate, you know, all the content that you do and our goal is never to minimize the work. Right. But I'm speaking on behalf too of, of, the, uh, the, of the many, many community producers I didn't even know existed because of the way it is presented so that, and that's what I'm asking for, is a different way of, of presenting or highlighting. So, and that's all I'll say because I, uh, I appreciate so much our brief conversation now, and uh, we've gone over time. You know, usually half an hour is good enough for any focus show that I do. But thank you so much, Lauren Glenn Davidian, for speaking with me today, and for giving me the opportunity to provide programming for viewers on Town Meeting TV, Center for Media and Democracy. Well, Margaret, I just have to say you are fearless and the community content and the programs that you have covered have really provided different points of view for our, for our community to see. And that is my dream and hope that we do that. And we only, I'm not saying we only do it because of people like you. I mean, certainly we try to do that internally with the staff, but, but your community production is giving our community at large different ideas and ways to think about how to make the place we live and the world we live in the best possible place, the most equitable and just. And you play a big role in that. And I really appreciate it. It's always just a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, Lauren. Always a pleasure to speak with you. And you, you, just, you just defined the wonderful, your wonderful um, motivation for all that you do. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank, thank you, you, Channel 17, Center for Media and Democracy, Town Meeting TV. And thank you, Michael. Next... <laughs> thank you, Michael Blood. Thanks. Take care, everyone.